Greetings and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. I'm State Representative Mike Merwicki and we're in the studio today, even though it's during the legislative session, for a special program. Uh, a lot of the work I do in the House Human Service Committee uh, has to do with um, the various spectrum of human services. And within that spectrum, uh, we're de we deal with a lot of the issues we'll be talking about today, specifically uh, domestic violence, uh, sexual violence, homelessness, uh, supports for, for kids and families and women in these situations. And uh, today's setup in the studio here at BCTV is gonna be a little different. Uh, we have an advocate, um, community advocate Sherry from the Women's Freedom Center here in, in Brattleboro. And because of the, the nature of the work at the, the Women's Freedom Center, uh, when Sherry or other advocates um, present in, in, in the public, uh, they don't go on camera. Uh, there, there's a, a safety concern that uh, we want to respect. And so that's why we have a screen set up here. Uh, Sherry and I are going to have a conversation here. Well, we want to respect and, and honor the work that they do. So um, with that, uh, it, just wanted to prepare you that you're going to see a little different image here in the studio. So with that, I'm going to welcome Sherry for taking the time and coming and visiting today. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Um, the Women's Freedom Center has been serving the Brattleboro area for decades now. Um, perhaps not everybody viewing will know a lot about it. Can you share a little bit about the history of the Women's Freedom Center and, and how we how we got to where we are today? Yeah, good question. So, yeah, some folks are still familiar with us by our earlier name, which was the Women's Crisis Center. And then about three years ago, we changed our name to the Women's Freedom Center. And last year, in fact, we commemorated our 40th anniversary working to end domestic and sexual violence in Wyndham County. Um, and then um, just within the past year, we've expanded and have an office now that serves Southern Windsor County as well. Um, and so, yeah, you know, in 1974, uh, the grassroots uh, uh, beginning of the Women's Community Center, as it was known back then, began basically with a group of local women that were responding to the number of sexual assaults that were happening in our area. And there wasn't really any template for the kind of work they were doing. They taught themselves how to answer a hotline, um, get funding, uh, and what they quickly found out was that a lot of the calls they were getting were actually from women who were being abused by their male partners. Um, so domestic violence kind of came on board second. So we now, as I mentioned, are a dual program, domestic and sexual violence, and working to end that. Uh, that has been our mission ever since. Yeah. Now, um, we have some graphics we'll, we'll intersperse between uh, our conversation here. Um, if people need help right now, is there a number they can call? Absolutely. Our confidential 24-hour hotline number is 254-6954. And it's confidential. It's 24 hours a day. So that means if somebody calls it, uh, that information doesn't go anywhere else. They don't have to worry that somebody's... Uh, an abuser can find that information out from you. No, and in fact, and that's a great question, Mike. Actually, all of our work is completely confidential, and the caller doesn't even have to give her or his name, mm -hmm. basically, um, or real name if they want to just be sure. Sally. You know, we um, we absolutely will meet the caller um, in the conversation wherever they are with the information. We also, uniquely among service providers, are not mandated reporters, mm -hmm. so. Our primary goal is to be able to offer resources and information to somebody in crisis without them having the sense that maybe this is going to ripple out and, you know, cause us to call the police or mm -hmm. DCF or anyone else. Absolutely nothing will happen that the, that the caller doesn't want to have happen. Yeah. Well, and and that raises a question for me. Um, sometimes people don't want to leave a situation. They just want it to get better. Yeah. 
and, and what can you offer for people in the, that kind of circumstance? Well, we are open, I mean, we have a number of services and supports for survivors of domestic and sexual violence. Um, the 24-hour hotline is one. We have a confidential shelter. We offer safety planning, um, and we, you know, we interpret that pretty broadly. So safety planning um, could be if somebody is ready and wanting to leave the situation, it could absolutely also be safety planning if they're still hoping to stay in the relationship but wanting to minimize what the risks might be if the next time there is um, you know danger kind of looming so and that is a flashpoint isn't it yeah, or it can be a flashpoint it can be so we try to provide as much information um, you know based on what the caller identifies as her needs and what she's hoping for and sometimes if she's not aware um, of some of the resources or even safety concerns that we as advocates might hear, we will at least make her aware of what we're hearing or seeing based on the situation, just to give her the broadest spectrum to think about. But the decision is always hers. Um, we always work with women um, with the understanding that they're the experts on their own lives. Uh, we are just here to sort of reflect some of the, the options back to them and let them decide. Um, Safety-wise and otherwise, they need to be the ones making the decisions for their own lives. Sure. And is it different if there are children in the family? It can be different, for sure. Um, I mean, the, the risk factor there can increase. It can be that much more challenging to safely get out of a situation. Um, many times, uh, though that can be a tipping point, there are many, many women in domestic violence situations who um, have been, you know, the sort of the recipient of the violence, but once the children see or hear or themselves are harmed, that may be the tipping point that finally has the woman leave. Um, and so, you know, that absolutely is part of our work. Um, we connect with lots of moms of kids um, and try to let them know the resources in the community for all of them, basically. Yeah. Well, one of the things we've been working at at the State House just in the last uh, couple of weeks uh, has been the issue of homelessness yeah. and, and the reality that one of the causes often of homelessness for women and families is domestic violence, mm -hmm. where women and children are, uh, have to take flight or, or hide or, um, mm -hmm. or are put out of a situation. Um, what kind of services do you offer for people in that kind of a situation? Well, our um, our shelter obviously is um, sort of our, you know, ideally our first go-to resource if women really need or, or want to get out of the situation. And you know what a lot of folks may not know, and I was shocked by this number, is that here, you know, we our program turned 40 last year, but we're certainly not alone across the country. A lot of those first grassroots organizations have been turning 40 around the country, and so here we have been formally in this movement now for about 40 years and there are still about 1924 other programs like ours around the country so pretty much every county in the country has got some sort of program and a place where women and kids primarily can stay if they need to so um, you know sometimes women if they just get out of the situation with their batterer may be safe staying in this community, so they may be a good candidate to come into shelter. Very often, though, as we all know, you know, they're they're not going to feel or be safe in their own community, and they may have to put some greater distance between themselves and what home used to be. And that, of course, is a huge tragedy um, that they're really having to uproot. So some of the women we shelter at any time may be um, local women or at least Vermont women, and very often they're women who maybe have fled once or twice or several times several states away because their batterer has continued to find them and I would say that's probably the same for all programs some of their women are local or state women and others have come a stretch um, yeah. just to get some safety yeah um, you had said earlier that there, there are two uh, aspects of the work it's around domestic violence and sexual violence yeah well here we are in April yep. April is Sexual Violence Prevention or Awareness? Awareness Month, yeah. yep. Um, you also mentioned this is the 40th year. Last year was, so we're okay. like in 40 okay. and a half. <laughs> yeah. um, what's changed in those 40 years? Ugh, it's a great question. Um, I would say, you know, uh, 
There are certainly a lot more supports and services for survivors than there ever used to be. Um, and that is, you know, continues to be an uphill battle to continue to get funding for these programs, but the need really is incredible. It really is an epidemic that is kind of the backdrop for what happens in our culture, and especially around sexual violence. Um, it is still, you know, one of the most underreported crimes. Um, every two minutes in this country, there is a sexual assault. It's estimated that one in five women will experience sexual assault at some point in her lifetime. Um, I think the last statistic I saw is that by the age of 12, one in four girls will get unwanted sexual comments or touch, even in public. It's an enormous problem, and so, you know, what's changed in our culture is that there is more conversation about it now. 40 years ago, when our foremothers were even naming this problem, that was a revolutionary act, really, to name this problem that for the most part women had sort of silently absorbed and suffered with um, quietly. Um, but we still are up against some of the same age-old thinking, you know, some of the victim blaming and shaming mm -hmm. of victims, that hasn't changed much at all. There's been tremendous yeah. backlash. So, you know, the, the, the fight is definitely still on to try to really have an impact on what people may have heard called rape culture. We're yeah. still very much steeped in it. And with 21st century media, um, you know, there are tools there to help in activism, but then there are also tools there that perpetrators can use and do use every yeah. day um, to sort of augment their crimes and make it that much harder for victims to feel comfortable and safe coming forward. Mm -hmm. So that's what's changed. So in some ways, uh, the old French saying is yes. plus they change, or plus they même chose. Yep. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And in yeah. this case, the behaviors are still prevalent. Yeah, and one of the big um, parts of our outreach is to have more conscientious men feel not only comfortable speaking up, um, but feel welcome speaking up. It absolutely is going to take that. And sure. we know that, um, you know, we, we absolutely know that most men are not batterers, most men are not rapists, but 98% of rapists are male. Yeah. Overwhelmingly, batterers are male, perpetrators against female partners or even other male partners. And again, that's not to say it's okay if, if women use that behavior either. We, we've never um, wanted to be misinterpreted as saying that, but we know that this is still very much a gendered phenomenon in our culture. But it's not about maleness. It's about privilege. It's a, it's a learned behavior. It's a sense of privilege and entitlement. And that's where everybody um, has a stake in weighing in on this conversation, however we have it. Um, in our own circles, um, just having some conversation around that and out in the broader public as well. So we welcome more men stepping up to the mic, wherever that mic may be. Sure. Well, yeah. this mic is. Yes. <laughs> and, um, this is not a problem that's relegated to one demographic, though, is it? No, it isn't at all. Um, it cuts across all demographics, and um, especially around sexual assault, um, you know, the, um, the stereotype for, still to this day, but, um, you know, all along has been that it's stra the stranger in the bushes, um, but, you know, overwhelmingly, uh, female victims tend to know the male perpetrators. So, um, you know, the in, in quotes, sort of the helpful news around that is that most of us know victims and can have some positive impact um, on their lives by being supportive. Mm -hmm. Most of us, tragically, also know rapists, yeah. right? Um, know these guys that are positioning themselves uh, to commit a date rape of some kind. And there are ways that, uh, insightful bystanders can have an impact, yeah. can speak up uh, and, and do something on behalf of, you know, to, to intercept um, the next potential assault. So it's really important for men to stand up and talk to other men yeah. about how this is not okay. Yeah. Uh, whether it's verbal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's physical, because the the verbal is usually the first step, isn't it? You got it. You yeah. got it. Yeah, and I mean that um, that goes to the heart of it, really. It it can't 
just be conversations that women have with other women or with yeah. men. It really needs to be conversations that men have with each other around this because a lot of, um, I would say most of the either respect or disrespect that men learn to have for women and girls comes from other men, yeah. right? So men have enormous opportunity and I would say responsibility to, to, to say something, yeah. right? Because they have unique access to conversations with other men. And there are conversations men have with each other that women may never hear. Um, and, you know, that's hugely significant. They can have such a disproportionate impact there on um, raising, raising some awareness, yeah. changing some behavior. Well, certainly that's where uh, my involvement here began. Um, there had been, for years, uh, an awareness of of how men are still acting in ways that uh, are embarrassing, I think, to other men, uh, to our species in general. And through the last election cycle, uh, there were some really outrageous things being said, you know, right along from the, the legitimate rape right. comments that were being made by people in elective office or running for office uh, to the rationalizations that go on. And uh, locally, Bill Pels Walsh, who's a... Um, a good man, uh, a practicing therapist who focuses on domestic, helping domestic violence um, perpetrators uh, recognize their their behaviors and and get to a, a different place with that. Well, Bill and I talked, organized a meeting where a, a bunch of men and, and of all ages got got together and, and said we want to start um, trying to look at our own behavior, how we contribute it to that, even by just being silent, and what we can do next and, and, and be allied with what you're doing, with what everyone's doing at the Women's Freedom Center, and um, which leads me to a next step here. One of the reasons we're here is it's April, and there's an event coming up that uh, I encourage people to come to. I especially encourage men to be aware of and to show up and to, to be known as an ally in this situation, and that's the, the Take Back the Night. Uh, event. It's part of a national. Uh... It is. It is a national movement. It's been going on for a few decades, and I believe they actually happen internationally. Um, so yeah, take back the night um, is a rally. Um, it is a, a speak out, basically. It's a march, and usually in every community, it ends with a candlelight vigil. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, as you said, it is a chance for the community to come together um, and show solidarity with victims. And it's a chance for people to speak out if they want to or show silent support, um, but be part of uh, the activism against this and to show that, um, you know, not in our town, not in our community, it's not okay. And it, um, it pushes back on the sense that, first of all, um, that this is just, in quotes, a woman's issue. Mm -hmm. So we welcome male um, supporters coming out and, um, you know, we, we always try to zoom out and have the broadest possible conversation here and realize that we've all, we all live in a patriarchy still, right? Men come up in that system just as women do. Yeah. And, and suffer in ways and suffer, too because absolutely, of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, the, the sort of traditional sort of macho male code that can be so harmful to women and girls is so harmful to men and boys too. It always has been yeah. and, and you know, this, again, as, as we've said, is not just a women's issue, it's a, humans, a human rights issue. And so we welcome all conscientious participants to come out. Um, the event happens Friday evening, April 24th. We will meet at the Common at 6 o'clock. There will be music there, there will be a bread and puppet um, presentation, and people can bring signs if they want to make them. Any message they want, they can also just come. We are going to march down a particular route down Main Street street we will have megaphones there they can come and chant and sing with us through town we'll wrap, wrap back up at the common for a candlelight vigil anyone who would like to is welcome to say a few words or read a few words whether about their own healing journey or read a poem or say a few things about how we can help shift our culture they're welcome to do that at the candlelight vigil mm -hmm. if they have any questions they're welcome to give our office number a call and that is 257 7364. 
We are also um, making banners and things to carry down the street that night. And if people have any questions and want to participate in making those with us, they can give a call again to our office number and join us for that. Um, the number again is 257-7364, and that's just the office number. Sure. And if people call that number, um, is there a machine if they can't get through right Absolutely. away? Absolutely. Leave a voicemail, so, and, yeah. and I'll give them a call back, and we can talk about how they can help us make some protest art. Yeah. We would welcome that. Sure. Um, one of the things that you and I have been talking about uh, going back to the, the beginning of this year was the, the publicity campaign to dispel some of the myths mm -hmm. around sexual violence. Um, You've organized the, the public service announcement uh, series, which the governor participated in, mm -hmm. uh, Senator Leahy, I think, as well, yes. uh, Sheriff Clark. Yep. And, um, <coughs> and you. <laughs> and, right. Uh, thank you for allowing me that opportunity to, to participate in that. Uh, and I think it's helpful if we can continue putting this out. Uh, can you share some of what those myths are? Because we talked about the blaming culture, blaming the victim. Yep. And as an example, um, I think the PSA that I did talked about uh, the myth was if a woman is drunk, she's asking yeah. to be violated. Yeah. Or if she's wearing uh, suggestive clothing, uh, she's asking to be violated. And I know I, I had the rationale, someone said, if somebody's wearing jewelry, is that an invitation to steal it? Yeah. Well, it doesn't work that way. But can you share some of these myths that we're trying to address? Absolutely. And just in case um, folks have not heard this PSA series, it actually started last April, mm -hmm. uh, and it ran for 13 months, so from April to April on WTSA. And if they haven't heard these PSAs on the radio, BCTV is now going to start running them for this year, April through April. And it's a series of the myths that tend to underlie what we call rape culture and that um, basically let rapists off the hook. And you're right, one of the first myths um, is that somehow um, there's behavior or dress that somebody might wear or choose that somehow makes them okay to be raped. And the reality, of course, is that victims do not create rapists. It's the other way around. There is nothing anyone could wear um, that would suddenly pull a law-abiding person off the sidewalk and make them a rapist. We absolutely, absolutely have to debunk myths like that. Um, they're so toxic and they're so prevalent. Um, you know, one of the other myths that um, we began with, that whole series is called Vermont Men Speaking Out Against Sexual Violence because one of the challenges for activists has been the, per the misperception that this is just a women's issue. Um, and you know, men also um, are raped. Uh, not in the numbers that women are. Little boys are raped. Perpetrators overwhelmingly are male, but the victims can be anyone. Um, and so, you know, part of our pushing back was having more men feel comfortable speaking out about this. So it really does feel like a human rights campaign and not just something women have to keep fighting on. Um, so yeah, there are a number of myths here. Um, some of them, one of them is that rape, this is a myth, that rape is a sexual act, an act of passion. And the reality, of course, is that rape is a criminal act. It's an act to get power and control. It's a violent act. Sex is used as a weapon, but it has nothing to do with sex beyond that. Now, we've only got a few minutes left here. And uh, before we go, we can talk a little bit of again about the, the event that's coming up later in April. Um, but are there other points that you want to make before we come off the air? Uh, some information I'd like to know that you, you talked about the, the prevalence of domestic violence. Um, and you talked about the experiences that young women will have. Mm -hmm. General population, uh, how many women have had these experiences? How many come forward? Um, is this something we need to do better, is make our culture more um, open so people can feel comfortable coming forward? Um, Absolutely. Um, it, you know, it's estimated that one in five women will experience a sexual assault in her lifetime. In the military, the numbers are one in three. Um, overwhelmingly, in the civilian population, you know, 63% or more, depends on any year, the statistics will vary. Um, 
overwhelmingly they are not reported to police. Mm -hmm. And, you know, any look at what victims are up against, shaming, blaming, um, isolation, uh, threats made against them, there is so much that victims are up against if they do come forward that for many, um, you know, it actually feels like it would just be too hard to come forward. So one of the first waves of activism is support for victims. Mm -hmm. If, you know, sometimes just because women will not necessarily call the police doesn't mean they won't connect with an advocate. But even so, we don't hear as much from women as their friends and family and coworkers might. And so every single human being has the potential to be a, a caring ally if somebody comes forward, first and foremost, to believe, um, to express, um, you know, uh, concern and regret and being sorry that this has happened to somebody, everyone can reach out and have a conversation like that. And then to basically let the survivor know that whatever support she might like, we're here to offer some, some help and to not have an agenda for her. If she does not feel comfortable coming forward, that is her decision. It's her body, it's her yeah. choice, her life, and supporting her in that and not yeah. judging that either. Similar in domestic violence. Absolutely. Um, women are not always ready to report, yeah. not always ready to, to leave a situation yeah. where they're being abused. And um, I think what you're saying is it's important that we build supports yeah. for them to where they can make those decisions yeah. that, that are best for them. And in cases where there's children, uh, to protect them as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time today. Mike, thank you so much. Um, thank you for your, your ongoing work and, and everyone at the Women's Freedom Center and for the opportunity for now for me and for other men to be, in, to be better informed, to have a place to take our concerns uh, and, and our, I would say, starting with our disappointment with other men and what we can do to make, make things better. Uh, I, I would like to share my own perspective on one to be a better ally uh, f for you, for my daughters, for all the women in my life. And I think that most men out there would like to do the same and not always clear how we do that. So yeah. thank you yeah. for your, your kind education around this. Now, again, the event we're talking about is the Take Back the Night. Take Back the Night March. It's Friday, April 24th. We're meeting at The Common at yeah. 6 p.m. If people have any questions or if they want to actually help make some of the protest art beforehand, they can give our office a call at 257-7364. And our hotline number, again, our 24-hour confidential crisis hotline is 254-6954. Good. Thanks again, Mike. Well, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Sherry, for coming from the Women's Freedom Center, taking the time to, to better educate us and inform us of the event that's coming up, uh, Take Back the Night. Uh, I want to thank the people at BCTV for all the work they continue to do to help raise the level of conversation and make our, make our community better for everyone. Uh, next show will probably be from the State House again. We have uh, probably another month or so left in the legislative session. And I look forward to sharing some more of what's happening at the State House. Until then, this is Mike Merwicki, State Representative for the Wyndham Ford district of Putney, Dummerston and Westminster. Bye-bye now. Mm -hmm.